The much celebrated Welsh musical group Manic Street Preachers are perhaps best known for the soft rock melancholy of hits Motorcycle Emptiness and is designed for life. But back in the early 90s, the band seemed to be heading in a much edgier artistic direction, one influenced by a young man with a rather unassuming name of Richard James Edwards. Born in December of 1967 in the southern Welsh town of Blackwood, Richie showed a brooding intelligence from a very early age. He went on to study political history at the University of Swansea, but remained close to elementary school friends James, Nicky, and Sean, whom he had met while attending Oakdale Comprehensive. In 1986, the trio had formed a band, and although he was lacking in any kind of musical talent, Richie was keen to contribute, doing so vicariously by being their driver and roadie for much of their 1989 UK tour. He won the hearts of Mannix fans up and down the country with their frantic antics during their live shows, often miming the act of playing guitar whilst whipping the audience into a frenzy. But Richie wasn't just a hyperactive hype man, he was a genuine artist in his own right and although he couldn't physically contribute to the band's music, his vision and poetry heavily influenced both the sound and the lyrical content of the Manic Street Preacher's songs. In light of this, after wrapping up their tour in 89, he was officially invited to be the band's fourth member and spokesman. By 1994 and the release of the band's third album, The Holy Bible, Richie was responsible for around 80% of the band's lyrics some of his poetry was so profound that the band simply co-opted them wholesale for their songs. For example, Richie once showed them a poem that read, Blessed be the blade, blessed be the sight, Dionysus against the crucified, clean your flesh and mock your fears, the brightest sun is the purest gun. They were stunned. Richie has written just 27 words, yet that handful generated hundreds of separate thoughts on religion, clashes of culture, mortality, and the nature of the universe itself. A few months later, the poem was used word for word as the bulk of the lyrics for the song, Judge Yourself. Richie did this time and time again. He was the band's muse, someone their fans latched onto, their angst and melancholy made flesh. But to say Richie was a tortured genius would be the understatement of the century. From an early age, Richie suffered from a deep, unshakable depression and often discussed it with the members of the press. During a 1991 interview with a journalist from the NME, his artistic integrity was called into question, with the journalist suggesting that Richie's pessimistic worldview was nothing but a careful, curated facade. It said that Richie gave a wry smile before asking, Want to see how for real I am? The journalist nodded, and at that, Richie produced a razor blade from somewhere on his person and began to cut into his left forearm. The journalist recoiled at the sight, horrified at how well-practiced Richie seemed to be at butchering himself. When he was done, Richie showed the journalist a series of cuts that would later require 18 stitches. He had sliced, for real, into his arm. Richie later stated that he regularly self-harmed by either cutting himself or by stabbing cigarettes out onto his arms and legs. It makes me feel so much better, he said. All the little things that might have been annoying me suddenly seem so trivial because I'm either concentrating on the blood or the pain. I'm not a person who can scream and shout, so this is my only outlet. It's all very logical, really. Just prior to the release of the band's third album, Richie checked himself into Whitchurch Hospital and later the Priory Hospital, both of which specialize in issues of addiction and mental health. During the recording of The Holy Bible, Richie had been suffering from insomnia and drank heavily in order to get himself to sleep at night. It had gotten so bad that, as lead singer James Dean Bradfield put it, inevitably, the day would start with a the sound of a can opening. When he emerged from rehab, Richie's condition seemed to have improved somewhat. He was clean, sober, and had refrained from self-harm during his hospital stay. 
But during an appearance at the London Astoria on December 21st of 1994, he revealed that the improvements were merely skin deep. Towards the end of set closer You Love Us, Richie began smashing his guitar and damaging the venue's lighting system. Mannix fans mistook this as Richie's regular onstage antics, not realizing they were watching him perform for the very last time. February of 1995 saw the Manic Street Preachers achieve something that most, if not all, British musicians aim for, that elusive American tour. Their album, The Holy Bible, was riding the wave of grunge's successes that came to characterize the early to mid-90s, and Epic Records were hoping to capitalize on it. As you can imagine, everyone who knew or worked with the band were incredibly excited for them, but the band themselves were becoming increasingly anxious, and it was mostly down to Richie's increasingly bizarre behavior. In the two weeks before the band's US tour, Richie withdrew 200 pounds a day from his bank account, totaling 2,800 pounds by the day of the scheduled flight. Richie mentioned this was a way to pay for a new desk for his flat. However, there was no record of the desk having been paid for, and this would have explained only half of the money withdrawn. The night before the flight to the United States, Richie gave a friend a book called Novel with Cocaine, which details the author staying in a mental asylum before vanishing. He also gave a gift to his on and off again girlfriend, although it's said that they had permanently broken up just a few weeks prior. The following morning, instead of traveling to the airport with the rest of the band, Richie checked out of his hotel, drove to his flat in Cardiff, and left his passport there. After that, he seemed to literally drop off the face of the earth, and just a few days later, he was officially reported missing by his bandmates. Over the two weeks that followed, Richie was apparently spotted in a number of different places. One witness said that he spotted the man almost identical in appearance at the Newport Passport office. And in a seemingly more reliable instance, a fan of Richie's spotted him at Newport bus station, actually conversing with him briefly before parting. A taxi driver later came forward claiming that he had picked Richie up from the King's Hotel in Cardiff before driving him around a number of Welsh Valley towns, including Richie's hometown of Blackwood. The driver claimed that although the passenger had spoken in a Cockney accent, it had occasionally slipped into a Welsh one which had sounded considerably more natural. He thought nothing of it until hearing the news of Richie's disappearance, at which point it seemed oddly pertinent. The driver also stated that the passenger had gotten out at the Severn View service station in South Gloucestershire, and this gives his claims a great deal of credence indeed. That's because in mid-February, Richie's car was discovered at this very same service station with a dead battery. The Vauxhall Cavalier had been abandoned for several days by the time the police discovered it. There was ample evidence that Richie had been living in the car for some time, with takeaway containers and empty booze bottles strewn all over the interior. There were also several photographs of Richie's parents and siblings which had apparently been taken in the weeks prior. The location of the car's discovery was particularly worrying to all involved, as the Severn View service station refers to the River Severn, and the bridge that runs over it is a well-known spot where people will take their own lives. Despite this, Many of Richie's loved ones insisted that he was never the type to contemplate that sort of thing, referring to a quote from the previous year in where Richie said, In terms of the S-word, that doesn't enter my mind, and it never has done in terms of an attempt, because I am stronger than that. I might be a weak person, but I can take pain. On top of the fact that no corpse was ever found, the claim that Richie is still alive has been supported by dozens of eyewitness sightings from India to Lanzarote. The frequency of these sightings meant his family was extremely reluctant to declare him dead, and only did so in November of 2008, six years after they were legally entitled to. But some of those closest to Richie have a far more pessimistic view of the situation. For example, Richie's sister once mentioned how his favorite poem was Tulips by Sylvia Pla. It summed up everything he thought at the time he went, she said. He kept a copy of it and he asked for it to be read at his funeral. His thoughts must have been dominated by this poem, 
the theme, some messages. Tulips describes Plath's desire for death, while the titular tulips seem to will her to carry on living. It's a poem of soul-crushing depression and conflict, and the fact that it spoke to Richie so deeply leads us to some very dark conclusions indeed. The more cynical among us might posit that Richie is dead, and has been since 1995. But money talks, and although it might be a purely symbolic gesture, the Manic Street Preachers have been paying 25% of their royalties into Richie's bank account ever since he disappeared. They were doing this as late as 2005, and a sizable amount has amassed in his name, almost as if they're just waiting for him to come home. As Manic's bassist Nicky Wire once put it, it's a genuine rock and roll mystery. Then he's right. We have no definitive answers in this case, and no matter how likely it seems that Richie had taken his own life, there's simply no evidence to support such a hypothesis. In fact, it's just as likely that it looks like this because Richie wanted it to look like that. He'd amassed a small fortune in cash by the time he went missing, and it's entirely possible that Richie visited the Newport Passport office in order to pick up a different passport to the one that he left back in his apartment, maybe even a passport in a different name. And if that's the case, then all those sightings of him start to sound a little more credible. Maybe through escaping the spotlight and eschewing the rock and roll lifestyle he'd once embraced, Richie learned to stop judging and hurting himself, and finally started to heal. On the evening of Monday, August 30th of 1999, 44-year-old Dr. Yves Goddard closed up his small practice in the northern French town of Gaul. It had been an uneventful day, and neither the nurses nor the practice secretary had noticed anything amiss with Dr. Goddard. But the very next morning, Dr. Goddard canceled all remaining appointments for the week and told his staff to take the remainder of the week off. When asked if everything was okay, Dr. Goddard told his staff not to worry, and that he was simply taking some time off to take his children fishing. On this point, Dr. Goddard was true to his word and took his children fishing in the ponds of a place called Glonkery. The next day, September 1st, Dr. Goddard loaded his children onto a small Jeanneau sailing boat named the Nick. Although their mother was absent, Six-year-old Camille and four-year-old Marius were said to be very excited at the prospect of a waterborne adventure, and their father told the vessel's owner that he intended to take them on a cruise, one which would return on September 5th. Strangely, before setting sail, Dr. Goddard made a brief stop in the port of San Malu. It was here that he purchased a large amount of cleaning products, but they were items that he left in his Volkswagen camper van, which he had parked in a San Malu parking lot. The following morning after the Goddard set sail, French customs officers inspected the Nick between the areas of Cap Beraki and Cap Freyela. They later testified that they had noticed one of the Goddard children sleeping in the boat's hold. Everything seemed fairly in order with the Goddards, but when the good doctor was asked the reason behind his little cruise, the customs officer observed some very suspicious behavior. Dr. Goddard seemed reluctant to talk to them and actually appeared to change his story in the middle of telling it. Each of the customs officers made a note of this, but since Dr. Goddard didn't appear to be breaking any laws, they were unwilling and unable to arrest or detain him. All they could do was corroborate his story with the boat's owner back in San Malu to ensure that nothing too sinister was going on. Over the next few days, several witnesses spotted the Nick near the Bay of Breik. This included a waffle vendor at the small port, who formally testified that Goddard and his children came to buy waffles from her on September 3rd. Yet little did she know, this marked the last time anyone would see any of the Goddard family alive. The very next day, the Nick was spotted by a pair of hikers near a place called Pluasek. It had been completely abandoned. The day after, the Nick's small inflatable dinghy was recovered by a fishing boat. In the dinghy were a jacket and a checkbook in Goddard's name. The very time Gendarmerie in the port of Roscoff immediately opened an investigation into the family's disappearance and quickly found Dr. Goddard's VW camper van parked in Saint-Malou. 
This is how they discovered the abundance of cleaning supplies stashed away in the van's rear storage, but investigators found something considerably more disturbing. Blood. A whole lot of blood, along with doses of the pain-killing drug morphine. September 8th saw the police conduct a search of the Goddard family home, and it was there that they found more traces of blood, this time in the family bathroom, the living room, and in the parents' bedroom. This blood was determined to have belonged to Marie Goddard, Eve's second wife, who hadn't been seen since August 31st. This prompted French police to officially open a judicial murder investigation, with Dr. Goddard being the main subject of an international arrest warrant. Almost two weeks after the Goddards disappeared, sailors off the coast of the Channel Islands discovered a life jacket that had belonged to the Nick, floating among the waves. A week after that, the inflatable survival raft of Goddard's boat was recovered half deflated on a beach at Lime Bay on the southern English coast. Those who discovered it noted with grim curiosity at how the raft's canvas canopy had been completely removed, something which would render the raft extremely vulnerable to high waves. Obviously, due to the presence of Marie Goddard's blood in the van and at the Goddard home, French police had assumed that they were investigating a murder. However, the locations of the lift jackets and survival raft threw a huge amount of doubt onto the investigations. According to experts, it was impossible for these items to have been found at these locations as a result of ocean currents alone. In short, the items had to have been deliberately scattered in order to appear in their discovered locations, almost as if someone was trying to throw investigators off their scent. On top of that, once the dinghy's emergency inflation device had been detached, the dinghy could only have remained inflated for 72 hours after this device was removed. This means that someone had activated the dinghy at least 24 hours after the Goddards were presumed to be missing. It took four months for the next big break in the case to arrive, when a canvas bag was caught in a fisherman's net just off the coast of the Ile de Bats on January 16th of the year 2000. The bag contained numerous items belonging to all members of the Goddard family, including clothes, driver's licenses, insurance documents, checkbooks, binoculars, a hammer, and the entire contents of Marie France Goddard's personal handbag. Six months later, on the 55th anniversary of D-Day, a seashell harvester's boat brought up a human skull during a night fishing session. DNA testing revealed it had once belonged to six-year-old Camille Goddard, the first of the family to be confirmed dead. The discovery prompted speculation that the Nick had sank, claiming the lives of all three passengers. But despite the area being trawled by a French Navy mine hunter, no trace of the boat was ever found. On Sunday, February 11th of 2001, a business card belonging to Dr. Goddard was found by a man walking his dog on the beach. Then, on February 22nd, a bank card bearing Goddard's name was found on the very same stretch of beach. Investigators searched the beach thoroughly and ordered a minesweeper to survey the nearby seabed, but still no traces of the Nick were found. These events led the investigators to believe that Goddard stopped off at this beach and emptied the contents of his wallet there, most probably as a way of misleading those that might seek to find them. Further searches were carried out at the beach, including the tractor being used to sieve through the sand, but no more of Goddard or his family's personal effects were found. Yet it was discovered that all of these cards had not been in the water for long before being discovered, and had therefore not been thrown into the water in September 1999. Analysts believe they had actually been tossed into the English Channel sometime in early 2001. To all involved, the situation was clear. Someone was trying to make it look like the deaths of Eve Goddard and his children was an accident. But whether that was the murderer in question, an accomplice, or Dr. Goddard himself remained to be seen. It wasn't until September 13th of 2006 that Dr. Eve Goddard was officially declared dead. Two bones consisting of a femur and a tibia were dragged up from the seabed near a place called Herd's Deep and once analyzed, DNA showed that they belonged to Dr. Goddard. The confirmation of Dr. Goddard's death had brought about an end to most of the public interest in the case, 
as an accident was considerably less scandalous than a quadruple murder. Yet there was still the matter of Dr. Goddard's missing wife, Marie. In light of this, the court file was not immediately closed, and it could be argued that some rather strange potential sightings contributed to them remaining open. In October of 1999, not long after the Goddards had gone missing, a hotel owner on the Isle of Man claimed that Goddard and his children had stayed in his hotel between the 7th and the 14th of September. This is the first of a series of witness statements placing Goddard and his children at various locations all around the world. Sightings of them were also reported in Scotland, South Africa, Florida, and Crete. Yet perhaps the most credible sighting was on the Portuguese island of Madeira. Investigators discovered that Eve had inexplicably opened the bank account there in the time before his disappearance, but it's unclear if this was part of a wider plan that resulted in his accidental death. However, what's certain is that although Dr. Goddard placed funds in the account at the time of its creation, these funds remain untouched following the family's disappearance. Finally, in September of 2012, the San Malu public prosecutor stated that the only hypothesis we can exclude is that the family's disappearance was a simple sailing accident. And, even if it is the most likely line of investigation, we cannot formally confirm that Eve Goddard murdered his family. And with that, the case of the missing Goddard family was finally closed. Yet questions still linger as to the nature of their disappearance. As the public prosecutor stated, the only thing they can be sure of is that this was not just a mere sailing accident. Foul play most definitely occurred in some form. But was this bizarre and tragic attempt by Eve to eliminate his own family? Or has the entire thing been perpetrated by some faceless, shadowy figure who for all intent and purpose had committed the perfect crime? With their wedding set for Valentine's Day of 1988, North Carolina couple Harold and Aquila Degree couldn't have picked a more romantic date for their matrimony. They settled on Oakcrest Drive near the small town of Shelby, and within two years were the proud parents of children O'Brien and Asha. But as the children grew, so did their parents' careers, and by the time they were in double-digit ages, they were regular latchkey kids letting themselves into their home after school while being trusted to complete their homework unsupervised. Yet despite this advanced level of responsibility, the degree children remained relatively sheltered, with their parents ensuring that their lives revolved around family, school, and most importantly, church. And while many of their friends and neighbors were investing in newly affordable personal computers, the degrees eschewed that kind of connection to the wider world. Every time you turn on the TV, there was news of some predator who's lured somebody's kid away, Akila later said. Asha, in particular, seemed to take this in her stride and seemed more than content to remain within the boundaries her parents had set. She was a shy girl, Harold added, scared to death of dogs too. I don't think she'd ever have left the house unless she'd absolutely had to. And in retrospect, this makes what happened next even more difficult to comprehend. By February of the year 2000, Asha was a fourth grader at the nearby Falston Elementary School. Then, on Saturday, February 12th, Asha fouled out of her basketball team's first game of the season. Asha was their star point guard, and the team went on to lose the game, something which would severely upset her. However, her father later said that she seemed to get over the loss relatively quickly and was engrossed in her brother's game, which commenced shortly afterward. Befitting their routine, both children attended church the next morning before returning home and heading to bed at around 8 p.m. Around an hour later, the neighborhood's power suddenly went out after a car collided with a nearby electrical pole. Concerned that his children might be alarmed, Harold Degree went to the bedroom that his children shared in order to check on them, and both were asleep in their beds. Harold checked again at around 2.30 a.m., once again finding them safe and sound. But then, sometime between then and sunrise, 10-year-old O'Brien Degree recalled being awoken by the squeaking of his sister's bed springs. He assumed that she was simply changing her position and took no further interest in the noise. 
Yet, Asha wasn't just tossing and turning in her sleep. And what she did next would confound law enforcement and private investigators for decades to come. By police estimates, sometime between 3.15 and 3.30 a.m., nine-year-old Asha Degree got out of bed, packed a book bag with clothes and personal items, then walked out of her home and into the darkness. About a half hour later, a passing truck driver spotted Asha walking south along Highway 18, wearing a long-sleeved white t-shirt and white pants. They reported the sighting to police and after seeing a TV report regarding Asha's disappearance, thinking it was strange that such a small child would be out by herself at that hour. This truck driver then circled the area three times and spotted Asha disappearing into a wooded area at the side of the highway. The Cleveland County Sheriff would later state that he was pretty sure it was her because the descriptions they gave are consistent with what we know she was wearing. The only thing that doesn't quite add up is that on the night Asha supposedly ran away, there was a huge storm raging outside. If she was indeed planning on absconding on her own terms, why not wait for the following night when the weather wasn't so dreadful? However, we have to consider the reason Asha was dead set on leaving that night was in order to avoid attending school the following morning. She no doubt held herself personally responsible for her basketball team's loss, and it's entirely possible that the shame she felt caused her to act in an extremely irrational manner, running off into a rainy, windy night with only a few changes of clothes to aid her journey. The following morning, Akila Debris woke up just before six, then walked to her children's room to prepare them for school. It should have been a joyous day, as it was the couple's 12th wedding anniversary, but it was a day that would quickly degenerate from a celebratory occasion into a living nightmare. When Akila walked into her children's room, she found Asha's bed empty. She asked O'Brien where her sister was, but he had no idea, so as her young son climbed out of bed, Akila began an increasingly frantic search of the family property. When she failed to find her daughter, Harold suggested that Asha might have gone over to his mother's house across the street. But when Akila called over, Asha was still nowhere to be seen. That's when I went into panic mode, Akila later said. Not long after, we called the police. Less than 15 minutes after the first 911 call was made, police officers had arrived at Oak Crest Drive and the search for Asha had officially commenced. Police tracker dogs were called to the scene, but not a single one could pick up the girl's scent. After that, a combination of police officers, family members, and an increasing number of ad hoc volunteers began patrolling the neighborhood, calling out Asha's name. This is how the degrees neighbors made the grim realization that she was missing, as one by one, they heard the chorus of unanswered cries, the herald that something terrible had happened. By 7 a.m., the entire neighborhood was in a near frenzy, with some canceling their family plans in order to assist with the search. Local clergymen, upon hearing of Ash's disappearance, locked to the degree's home in order to comfort, console, and advise them. Within the first 24 hours, literally hundreds of man-hours had been poured into the search, but not a single trace of Asha could be found. After a complete inventory of Asha's belongings was made, and in conjunction with her parents, investigators managed to figure out exactly what she'd taken with her that night. Bearing in mind it was a freezing, stormy February night when she ran away, yet Asha didn't take a single item of winter clothing with her. This led many in the investigation to posit that Asha was only planning on walking a short distance because she was meeting someone that would provide her with much needed shelter and warmth. This seemed to be corroborated on February 15th when police searched an abandoned shed near the area she was last sighted. They found candy wrappers along with a pencil, a marker, and a Mickey Mouse shaped hair bow that were confirmed as having belonged to Asha. Police also found a photograph of a black girl around Asha's age, but had no idea who the girl might be. These were the only traces of Asha recovered during the initial search effort, and a week later, after 9,000 man-hours had been invested into the search of the two to three mile radius of where she had last been seen, 
the preliminary search effort was called off. Missing person flyers had been posted all over the area and almost 300 possible sightings had been reported. But still the police lacked a single, solid, substantial lead. County Sheriff Dan Crawford urged the media to keep the story alive, but behind the scenes, things were looking bleak to say the least. By February 22nd, Sheriff Crawford announced that the search for Asha was recommencing, but that the scope of the search was now long range. Both the FBI and North Carolina's State Bureau of Investigation put her on their respective databases of missing children, while agents conducted intensive searches in the area of her home and route. Based on what Asha had taken with her, investigators believed she had been planning and preparing for her departure over the course of several days. She's not your typical runaway, said one FBI agent. While well, another expert from the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children noted that most children who run away are usually at least 12 years old. To the federal agents, it seemed Asha had definitely run away to avoid the shame of returning to school on Monday. Yet most children who do similar things are quick to realize their mistake and soon return home. Therefore, the most probable explanation was that Asha had either been sidetracked or had been straight up abducted. Shortly after she was declared missing, the Degree family succeeded in gaining national media attention, even appearing on the Montel Williams show to call attention to the case. America's Most Wanted and the Oprah Winfrey show also devoted segments to it, ensuring that pictures of Asha's face and belongings were broadcast to homes all across North America and even the wider world. Then, on August 31st of 2001, Asha's book bag and other personal items were discovered by construction workers near Highway 18, about 26 miles north of Shelby. All had been wrapped in a single plastic bag. The FBI brought all evidence to their headquarters for further forensic analysis. The results of this analysis had not been shared publicly, yet on the 20th anniversary of Asha's disappearance, the FBI confirmed that the book bag contained a copy of Dr. Seuss's McElligot's Pool and a t-shirt depicting the band New Kids on the Block. Neither appeared to have been her property before they were found in her bag, and the book was discovered to be from the library at her elementary school. This led many to suspect that her abductor had not only lured her away from home with the promise of gifts, but also that Asha may have known her captor through her elementary school. In 2004, the Cleveland County Sheriff's Department acted on a tip reportedly received from an inmate at the county jail. Personnel from the Sheriff's Office began digging at an intersection in Lawndale, uncovering a cluster of bones in the process. However, the bones were discovered to be from nothing more than an animal. It marked yet another disappointment in what had already been a series of them and the Degree family had to fight to keep Ash's memory alive. In the year 2008, they established a scholarship in her name for a deserving local student and began hosting an annual walk to raise awareness and money to fund search efforts for Asha. Pictures of Asha, both real and those showing her as she might appear in later years, are shown to participants, and Akila Debris has often said that there's a wonderful energy surrounding these walks, so much so that Akila has faith that her daughter is still alive, saying that, I fully expect her to walk through the door one day. The Degree family's hopes were further renewed in February of 2015, when the FBI announced that it was working with the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office and State Bureau of Investigation to reopen Ash's case. Authorities also announced a combined $45,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for Ash's abduction. It might well have been the prospect of financial gain that motivated the tipster, but in May of 2016, the FBI announced a possible new lead in the case. A witness had spotted Asha climbing into the passenger seat of a dark green early 70s Lincoln Continental, or possibly a Ford Thunderbird from the same era. The sighting was on Route 18, not far from where she was last seen and the vehicle was described as having rust around its wheel wells. The FBI also announced that its child abduction rapid deployment team had arrived in Cleveland County to provide on-the-ground investigative, technical, behavioral analysis, 
and analytical support to find out more about what happened to Asha. And by September of 2017, investigators had conducted over three separate interviews with almost two dozen witnesses and people of interest. Then, in November of 2020, a federal inmate by the name of Marcus Mellon wrote a letter to the Shelby Star claiming that not only had Asha been killed, but that he knew where to find her. Shockingly, this lead unearthed an entirely separate murder case and was completely unconnected to Asha's disappearance. Some took this as good news, a sign that Asha might still be alive. Others found the disappointment chipped away at their already diminished hope. Yet both parties are still left without answers in a case to characterize by false leads and dead ends. The February 2021 result of Marcus Mellon's letter is the most recent update in Ash's disappearance, a case that might well be solved any day now. If Ash is still alive, and there's still a chance of that, she'll be 22 years old this August. By some miracles, she might just emerge from the woodwork, having lived her life under some other name in some other place, away from her loving parents. But those who care for her have to emotionally insulate themselves because with a case like Asha's, there's very little chance that she'll ever be seen alive again. On Boxing Day evening of 1996, Childhood friends David Spencer and Patrick Warren departed their homes in the English town of Solly Hole to play outside. Patrick was riding on his brand new bicycle, his most prized Christmas present of that year, while his friend David was on foot. They had supposedly headed out to a place called Meriden Park, where they had played with other children near the park's pond. Due to the frigid temperatures of the season, the park's pond was completely frozen over and as David and Patrick played with a group of other children, a police officer recalled warning them to stay away from the frozen pond. Derek and Patrick then returned home and informed their parents that they were headed over to one of Patrick's older brother's places in order to hang out. Patrick had a number of older brothers by that time, some of which had moved out of the family home due to their advanced age. When the boys failed to arrive home later that evening, their parents assumed that they had slept over at Patrick's brother's place. Yet when this brother informed them that the boys had failed to arrive the previous evening, the first pangs of panic began to set in. The boys' parents quickly discovered that the last known sighting of them was when a gas station attendant had given them a packet of biscuits just after midnight. The attendant added that he witnessed the boys walking in the direction of a local shopping center Police searched this gas station only to discover Patrick's brand new red Apollo bicycle abandoned behind the petrol station trash cans, explaining why both boys were on foot at the time of the sighting. At first, the local police force treated the boys' disappearance like any other missing person case and refused to acknowledge that the boys may have come to any harm. The decision was later slammed by the general public, who championed one criminologist's opinion that if it had been two middle-class boys that went missing, that case would have been treated initially very different. And it's about the word we're never allowed to use. Class. This was about a class judgment that was made which was prepared to see them as runaways as opposed to vulnerable. Some have argued that this same prejudice meant the boys' disappearance received very little media attention beyond local media sources. But it should be noted that David and Patrick's faces were the first to appear on milk cartons. The National Missing Persons Helpline had noticed a similar initiative in the U.S. had found a great deal of success and launched an almost identical campaign in April of 1997. A few days after the boys went missing, the dead body of 17-year-old Nicola Dixon was discovered in a graveyard over in neighboring Sutton, Coldfield. Her killer was arrested, charged and convicted of murder, Yet despite many of the boys' loved ones insisting that the man might have been involved in their disappearance, he was never investigated or questioned in connection with it. It also seems like the Nicola Dixon case soaked up the majority of news coverage, leaving Patrick and David's very much on the back burner. In light of this, police resources were poured into the former case, while the latter seems to have been almost entirely neglected. Weeks without answers turned into months of mystery, and as the years ticked over, 
The family seemed no closer to finding out what had happened to David and Patrick. In 2003, the family's hopes were renewed when West Midlands police announced that they had arrested a 37-year-old man in connection with the disappearances. But these hopes were quickly dashed when he was later released on bail shortly afterward. To date, no formal charges have been brought against this individual, and the arrest seems to have simply muddied the waters in what was already a complicated case. On the 10th anniversary of their disappearance, the boys were the subject of a BBC Crime Watch special, one which appealed for fresh information from potential eyewitnesses. Almost a quarter of a million Brits tuned into the broadcast, but the appeal failed to generate a single new lead. Only after a second Crime Watch special did leads start to trickle in, but it seems to have been a case of quality as opposed to quantity, because shortly afterward, the police declared that they were closer than ever to learning the truth of David and Patrick's fate. Although this lead was not revealed to the public for some time, it seems their suspect was a convicted murderer named Brian Field. Brian had also been convicted of possessing indecent images of minors and, given the boys' ages, this obviously made him a prime suspect. Yet despite a number of interviews and dozens of man-hours of investigation, no confession could be secured. Nor could any tangible link be established between Field and the two boys, meaning any attempt at a conviction would be ultimately fruitless. In contrast to their inability to create a case against him, the circumstantial evidence supporting Brian Field's guilt was almost overwhelming. His previous conviction was for the murder of 14-year-old schoolboy Roy Toodle in 2001. The murder had occurred way back in 1968, but new DNA evidence had secured a guilty verdict and at the time of Patrick and David's disappearance, Brian had been living barely a block away from the gas station they were last spotted at. Field had worked as a self-employed gardener for a number of local families, meaning there's a good chance that the boys were not only familiar with him, but they might have actually trusted him as a prominent figure in their community. This means that if Brian had pulled over to offer them a lift, just as he'd done with little Roy Toodle, there's no reason that they'd have been wary of entering this vehicle. Field also had been convicted of attacking two teenage boys after offering them a lift. Once they had climbed into his car, Brian threatened them with a wheel brace and told them to remove their clothes. But thankfully, they were both able to escape after jumping from the moving car. Brian remains the only person in British criminal history to have been convicted for such a thing, as, ostensibly, the police had to change the law just to punish him for such a bizarre and terrifying crime. In 2006, forensic examiners dug up a patch of land that Brian had once used as a dumping ground at Old Bamson Lane in Solihull. But unfortunately, they found nothing belonging to either David or Patrick. It was later established that Brian had been driving around the area the boys had been in on the same night they disappeared. He also admitted to having driven while drunk. It should be noted that Field was known to have turned violent when drunk and that he committed most of his crimes under the influence of alcohol. And by his own admission, alcohol was a trigger for him wanting to commit his crimes. Evidence also existed which indicated that Field had been seen speaking to the boys in the days before their disappearance, suggesting that Field may have groomed the children in the time before they vanished. This could explain why no one heard screams or a struggle on the night of the boys' disappearance as the boys may have already known Field and got into his vehicle willingly. Graham Hill, the detective who secured Brian's 2001 confession, has stated on numerous occasions that he believes Brian is responsible for the boys' disappearance. He has also professed his doubt that either of the boys survived that night they were abducted. In 2016, a fresh appeal for information was launched, with West Midlands police promising that the force would never close the case until it discovered what had happened to David and Patrick. But here we are, almost six years later, and still we're no closer to knowing what happened to them. Yet it should be noted that this is not so much down to police incompetence, as despite their early reluctance to act, law enforcement has since poured time and resources into finding David and Patrick. At this point, it seems much more likely that the only reason the boys hadn't been found is that the monster who killed them refuses to reveal 
their final resting places. Lee Marina Oki was born in Hawaii on August 21st of 1979 as the daughter of U.S. Army soldiers Donald Oki and Vicki Felton. The couple had met while stationed in California, dating briefly before tying the knot in 1977. However, their marriage was not to last, and by the time Lee was just two years old, her parents had separated. Her father was posted to Germany shortly afterwards, while Lee and her mother started life in Tupelo, Mississippi. By August of 1992, Lee was 13 years old and was still living in Mississippi with her mother, while her father had finished his posting in Germany and was residing in the state of Virginia. Then, on the morning of Thursday, August 27th, Vicki Felton arrived at her office only to be notified of the approaching Hurricane Andrew. Sometime around 9 a.m., Vicki telephoned home to Lee to warn her of the severe weather, but no one picked up the phone. Naturally, this concerned Vicki greatly, so she traveled back home to check on her daughter. According to her, she arrived back home to find her garage door slightly open with the light on. Then, after entering the house, she noticed blood smeared on one of the walls. I started calling for Lee and going through all the rooms, Vicky later said. Then, when I went into her bedroom, I found her favorite blanket was crumpled up on the floor. That's when I started getting very scared. Not long after that, I called 911. Given how crucial it is to act within the first 48 hours of a disappearance, law enforcement rushed into action. They found additional pools of blood in the upstairs bedroom belonging to Lee, as well as blood smeared in the hallway walls, in the bathroom, and on the bedroom door. The pattern of the blood smear suggested that someone had made rudimentary attempts to clean the crime scene. When prompted by police, Vicki Felton noticed that several articles of her daughter's clothing were missing from her room, and despite there being no signs of forced entry to the home, a nightgown belonging to her daughter was drenched in blood. The positioning of the blood led us to believe that some kind of above-the-neck injury had been inflicted, said Tupelo's chief of police, and for obvious reasons, this didn't bode well for Lee's safety. Search and rescue efforts began immediately following the search of Vicky's home, but barely a single trace of Lee could be discovered, and while most people clung to the hope that Lee was still alive, Donald Oki was considerably less optimistic. I knew my daughter was dead the day my ex-wife called me and told me she was missing, Donald later said. My theory is that someone beat that child to death in that house, then took her body with them. September 9th of 1992 saw a package arrive at Vicky's home on Honey Locust Drive. It was addressed to her partner, the man accused of abusing Lee, and it contained the young girl's glasses. Naturally, this arose a great deal of suspicion, and it wasn't long until the FBI stepped in to forensically analyze the package's contents. One of their first tasks was to DNA test the stamps that had been stuck to the package, yet it was discovered that whoever had sent it used water to activate the adhesive, not their own saliva. Some believe this indicated a sophisticated and motivated kidnapper, whereas some believe the package was nothing but a distraction. There's no ransom letter or anything like that that came with those glasses, said police chief Bart Aguirre. It was just those glasses. You would think if it was an actual kidnapping, you would have expected a little more to come along with that. Following the successful polygraph examination of Vicky Felton's partner, it was her turn to take a test. In the end, Vicky would undergo three separate polygraph tests, one with local police, two with the FBI, and on every single one, there were indications of deception on her part. As late as 2017, Chief Bart Aguirre insisted that Vicky was still considered a person of interest. You still can't eliminate her. There are still too many unanswered questions for Vicky, and I don't know if that is unusual for somebody to go off to work and say, well, I just left Lee, but I'm going to call and check on her. Why check on her that soon after she had just left? Vicky Felton vehemently denies that she had anything to do with her daughter's disappearance and has repeatedly stated that she believes a man named Oscar McKinley Kearns was responsible for her daughter's kidnapping. 
Kearns was convicted of kidnapping and assault just nine months after Lee disappeared. And it also kidnapped and assaulted a ninth grade girl in Tupelo, the very same town that Lee had vanished from. This coward must have really felt like a tough man or woman to beat a little girl to death. Donald Oki was quoted as saying, I can't help but think of how horrified Lee must have been while this piece of human garbage beat her to death and watch her bleed out in the hall. Yet despite the obvious similarities between the two cases, Oscar Kearns is yet to face any official charges. Although the fact he's still in prison for the Tupelo kidnapping of 1999 means that if he requires questioning, the police will know where to find him. It's cases like this that remind us that a tiny fraction of the population commits most of the violent crime. A Swedish study from 2013 set out to determine the distribution of violent crime convictions in the Swedish population and to identify the criminal, academic, parental, and psychiatric factors responsible for the persistence of violent crime. It found that just 1% of the population was responsible for a whopping 63% of violent incidents. And it's almost like this is echoed in the case of Oscar Kearns. Here we have a single person, twice convicted of traumatizing assaults, and those are just the ones we know of. Just as the Tupelo chief of police stated, we can't roll out certain figures in the investigation. Both Lee's mother and her stepfather have rightfully come under suspicion. But if I was a gambling man, I wouldn't bet against Oscar Kearns. Because a man like that, with a proven track record of malevolent deviance, probably has far more skeletons in his closet than we can possibly imagine.